Good evening. Well, tonight is a sellout, and it's so great to have you all here on this rainy and cold but very festive time in New York and for a really fabulous evening. Uh, this evening, The New Yorker on China, a look back at four decades of reporting on China, is indeed a very special night and also a convergence of two anniversaries. The New Yorker is celebrating its 90th this year. It was one of the first Western media to have access to China after the revolution in 1949. And of our five distinguished guest panelists tonight, uh, one who's not a guest, our own Orville Shell, I'll talk about in a moment, they have collectively over 100 years of observation and writing on China. And um, I think you will all find this very enlightening and no doubt entertaining. Um, this includes, of course, our own Orville Shell, who's Asia Society's Center on U.S.-China Relations, Arthur Ross Director, and the founding director of it. We're so pleased to have Janet Ross here with us tonight. Hello, Janet, yes. <laughs> and um, I have learned recently that Orville's first contribution to The New Yorker was in the 70s, when The New Yorker produced five consecutive issues on China. I guess almost whole issues on China, solely devoted, quite a thing in the 70s. And, but I've also learned that Orville was so delighted with his first paycheck, David, from the New Yorker, that he went and bought a tractor for his ranch in California. And he says this was following Mao's directive to, in the Cultural Revolution, to head to the countryside. So <laughs> Orville, <laughs> very good. Um, for Asia Society, it's also an anniversary, our 60th anniversary since our founding by John D. Rockefeller III. Uh, as part of that, I've been up to the Rockefeller archives in Picantico, and I became very curious about one question. When did the Rockefeller family get interested in Asia and China? And that route took me back to 1863 or 64, when the original John D. Rockefeller, who was a very poor man at the time, 25 years old, sent half his monthly salary as a store clerk, which was all of about $24 a month, half of that to China to help malnourished children. Uh, from that, you see a family's interest in and devotion to the development of China, including the founding of the China Medical Board in 1914, which just celebrated its 100th anniversary. And then, of course, John D. Rockefeller III, who, following World War II, really felt the world needed a center to focus on U.S.-Asia relations. And in his mind, if there was great troubles in the future and great opportunity, it would come between the West and the East, and so created Asia Society at the time. So two important landmarks in that. This event in particular is part of our China File Presents program. China File is a online magazine that we started about three years ago. Editors and staff are here. You just raise your hands. Amazing team of people. Um, and we have done a series of these. So we brought in a generation of New York Times reporters on China, seven correspondents, including Seymour Topping. Um, who reported on the Chinese Civil War way back when, and also uh, the Wall Street Journal has come in and the Financial Times, and, uh, and now, of course, the New Yorker. Um, usually, Orville's the moderator tonight. He will be a panelist talking about his experience and his continued writing with the New Yorker. Uh, David, this is all yours. I will just say to everyone, we have an online audience. Um, they can join the conversation with hashtag Asia Society Live on Twitter and ask questions of the panelists. And you'll be getting an iPad with those questions, David, and there's always a lively spate of those from the online community. So welcome, everyone, and please welcome David Remnick, the editor of The New Yorker, and <laughs> the panelists. Good evening. I, I, I am indeed David Remnick, and I, I need to um, caution you 
that um, if this were a panel on the Middle East or Russia or a few other subjects, I would be swimmingly at home. I've been to China twice. So um, you'll forgive my naive questions. Um, I'm, I'm going to do the best I can. But they're questions that are editor questions, too, Think, kind of things that I want to know um, from writers out in the field, whether they're writing from Beijing, Shanghai, Hong Kong, or as in the case of the person I'll introduce first, uh, Chinese American institutions right down the street um, to begin with. And I'm, and I'm sure she'll be writing someday uh, even more frequently from, from China. But let, let me introduce our panelists. It, it could not be a more distinguished um, group. To my immediate right, Jiang Fan moved to the United States from Chongqing at the age of eight. She blogs frequently about current events on NewYorker.com about China. And as she <clears throat> conveyed to me, she, quote, has yet to publish any prize-winning books on her homeland, unlike her illustrious compatriots down, up and down the table. And she has, I should say, published an absolutely terrific piece on a bank in Chinatown that was weirdly the one bank that was prosecuted in the financial catastrophe of 2008. <laughs> Evan Osnos, second to my left, lived in China from, we're doing this slightly in age form, I, 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 but <laughs> let me cast no aspersions. <laughs> Uh, up or down. Evan Osnos lived in Beijing from 2005 to 2013. He was a staff writer for the Chicago Tribune, and I very, very wisely stole him in 2008. His first piece in China for us was about a gold medalist in boxing, and over the years he's written about everything from neoconservatism in China, why young men and women studied English, about a barber who beat the house in Macau, and the triad gangs that tried to extract the money from him in all the ways you can predict, um, as well as pro profiles of some influential people, including the writer Han Han, and earlier this year, the president of China. Uh, an absolutely remarkable feat of reporting, particularly when you don't have access to the subject. That's not an easy thing to do. <laughs> Last year, he published um, a book called The Age of Ambition, which basically won every award under the sun. Peter Hessler, where's Peter? To my far right, drinking some Mountain Dew, which they have in China, or they, they have everything in China. Peter first went to live in China with the Peace Corps, which um, sent him uh, to teach in an English, uh, at, teach, teach English at a teacher's college in Fuling, a small city in the southwest from 1996 to 1998. And that became the subject of his astonishing first book, Rivertown. In 1999, he moved to Beijing to become a freelancer, and the following year, he started writing, thank God, for The New Yorker. Peter wrote a trilogy of books about the country, and the other two, he's written a trilogy of books about the country, and the other two are Oracle Bones and Country Driving. He's also published a collection of pieces from China, the American West, and other places like Nepal and Japan called Strange Stones, Dispatches from East and West. He now lives with his wife and five-year-old twins in an equally gentle and calming and underpopulated place, Cairo. <laughs> Zhang Ying Jia was born in Beijing and has lived extensively both in the United States and in China over the years and writes, I don't know how she does this, unbelievably fluidly and elegantly in both languages. Well, not that I would know about Chinese, but I'm, I, am, <clears throat> I am absolutely sure that's the case. Her books include China Pop, How Soap Operas, Tabloids, and Best Sellers Are Transforming a Country, and Tide Players, The Movers and Shakers of a Rising China. And finally, um, really, in, in this case, the grand old man of China writing for The New Yorker, not, not that I don't mean that, I mean that with love. <laughs> <laughs> he is... Um, an astonishment. He really is a pioneer in the writing about China. He is, as, as you know, served as the dean of the University of California Berkeley Graduate School of Journalism. He is a scholar, uh, a writer, a producer, and a teacher, and he has written and edited a raft of books on China. And I want to start with Oroville. You went to China for The New Yorker for the first time in the 70s. And just to sort of lay a groundwork, um, not that the whole world is about what it's like for reporters, but since the evening is dedicated to that, at least in part, 
What was it like to arrive in China as a reporter? What, was, what, were, what were you able to do? What were you not able to do? How did you live? What did you eat? Who did you know? Who did you not know? What was it like? Well, it was uh, really, literally, I think uh, one could say like an otherworldly experience. Uh, because like others uh, who had been trying to make sense out of China, we had to peer in at it from the outside. And it became something of a, uh, uh, a tremendous lure precisely because of its uh, refusal to accept us and its sort of unavailability and willingness to assimilate. So when I finally got there, <clears throat> There was something of a moment of, uh, you know, a hajira, uh, a trip to the sort of holy land, if you will. But I have to say that once there, I was pretty perplexed because uh, I spoke Chinese. I had lived with Chinese. I thought I had a rudimentary understanding of how to get along. And yet what uh, when confronted as a foreigner was a kind of a profound indigestibility. One was really shut out. Nobody felt comfortable having an informal conversation with you even, much less inviting you to their house, uh, much less allowing any kind of unauthorized interaction. So it was very much of a, of an, and I was uh, on a youth work brigade, working in a model agricultural uh, brigade on a commune, and then in an electrical machinery factory in Shanghai. And it was very stylized, very ritualized, and I found it very perplexing, leaving me wondering exactly what to make of this place. So Orville, next week I'm going for the, I don't know how many of time, to um, Israel and Palestine to do a story. When I arrive at the hotel, my phone already starts ringing. People will, are banging at the hotel. Not that I'm such a lure, but this is the style, right? Right. It's, it's a democracy. It has all kinds of problems. God knows. Palestinians have all kinds of things to say and restrictions thereof. But it is a, it's, a, it's easy. I have to admit it. It's very easy. Russia is easy. Um, if you can't find a story there, it, it, um, you should go do something else. <laughs> How did you, so you, you, you're on a work brigade. So, in other words, you're not there to write about politics. You're there to do what? How, how are you beginning to see a story, to write about what? The New Yorker expects what? I, I, I can't even imagine this. Well, I remember sitting in my room in the Beijing Hotel, which had just gone up. It was the only high-rise building in all of Beijing. And any of you who've been there recently will know that is quite a, 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 you know, a, a, a step since then. But thinking, looking at the telephone and thinking, you know, there's literally nobody to call. <laughs> and the phone was not going to ring. Uh, so I think in those days, you pretty much had to resign yourself that the story was not to find out things that uh, you would, you know, through investigative reporting, through interviews. The story was what China wanted to present itself as, what it wanted you to see, what its sort of stagecraft was all about. And when you look back at what you were writing in the 70s, now that you know the country, you've been there a million times, it's much more penetrable to you, uh, there's a giant literature that you've no doubt availed yourself of by, by Chinese writers and, 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 and Western writers and, and the rest. What did you get right? What was off? You know, I, one thing I have to say, being there while Mao was still alive and the Cultural Revolution was still going, there was not one single scintilla of evidence that this place would ever change. So you looked at it and you could not see easily the fracture points. You could not see the contradictions. You just saw what you were enabled to see. Uh, and I think... Um, it was very difficult to, uh, the part that was hard to get right was uh, what were the uh, sort of the, the internal uh, forces that would ultimately drive this country and the way in which it would go. And I think it was a profound lesson for me because what it suggested was that China does often undergo tectonic changes, almost none of which were are visible. predictable or visible. 
Jenny, you grew up there, obviously. Yeah. And tell us a little bit about how you first um, decide to write about this place that you know from a very diff different angle of vision than Orville Shell, who grew up in New York and, and, and had a markedly different childhood than yours. I think you want to do that. Oh, OK. Uh, actually, as Orvi was telling his uh, story about his first encounter with China, I was reminiscing about my first encounter with America. Because a decade later, in the early 1980s, I came to the States as a student. And I ended up in, of all places, South Carolina, <laughs> in um, Columbia. So it was a state capital, but when I arrived, I felt this was nothing like I expected. It was like out in the boonies, and some kind of cow pad. In fact, we want a work brigade. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I was just a student in scholarship, and I was actually shown around campus by the chairman of the English department, which I was a graduate student in, um, testifying this is really uh, someone from Red China. And the first American friend I made was actually apologizing to me like, we really don't know anything about China. Do you have electricity? And then, you know, he actually asked me things like, are there, is your um, delicacy something like um, uh, grasshopper dipped in chocolate sauce? You know, that was all he could think of. And then there's very, really little contact between the two countries. So when my classmates in Beijing called me a year later, because you, you really didn't have any money to, to write, or, I mean, to call. So my classmates in China would be saying like, so, huh, you're in the Guizhou of America, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> you know where Guizhou is, you know, this is a very poor out of Yeah, they got that right. right. Yeah, so yeah. we have this mutual kind of, I think, um, ignorance or um, maybe suspicion or misconception of each other. So, the, so if I can interrupt, so when you're picking up the New York Times in the 80s and maybe the New Yorker or wherever and you're reading about China yeah. in English, did it resemble reality to you in any way? What, was it interesting? Was it, was it, or was it like reading about the other side of the moon? I think actually in the 80s when I was a student, I was not, this was before my New Yorker reading days. I that, knew about it, it was that. like. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Let's try the New York Times. Yeah, I went, uh, yeah. <laughs> Both have become my, I, uh, addicted to later. After I went back to China and came back again, uh, I think, you know, New Yorker was such an icon uh, in China, but it was literally a myth. Uh, so it was, in fact, quite a cool when I first published my piece in the New Yorker because people really thought this was, you know, the, you know, sort of uh, place that you could have uh, both, you know, good writing and in-depth kind of quirky, you know, takes on China. And so it's viewed as a writer's magazine. And um, the fact that, you know, I decided to write in English, of course, that was a long story. It had something to do with returning to the States again after Tiananmen. Mm -hmm. And that was actually um, one of the first subject of my, my first book, China Pop, was about the transition after Tiananmen. So I, I think you know, um, that was a confusing period when um, my generation of Chinese uh, sort of had this very romantic idea about the States, not just about the wealth, but as an icon of you know free speech and all that, and and did, and did we and did we disappoint you in in some way? <laughs> well, I don't mean I'm not joking. Did 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 the yeah? Actually, this is yeah. a, a kind of a sobering uh, subject now because because I think since then um, the vision has changed a lot on both sides. I was I was. Um, uh, watching the Republican debate the other day, and and, <laughs> and, and, and I saw you know China bashing. We yeah. Can I just say I'm sorry? <laughs> <laughs> I begin every day. Wake. I wake up and I turn to my wife and I just say I, I apologize. <laughs> and for the Republican debate, I, I I apologize. Yeah, and I think that it really hasn't come out of nowhere because if you look at the U.S. Uh, reporting uh, of the last. 15 years or a decade, there's basically two kinds of China bashing going on regularly. One line is this um, image of China as this uh, ominous giant that's mm -hmm. been playing unfairly with us and it's eating our lunch, stealing our jobs, and, and it's going to crush us, right? Mm -hmm. um, the other line is this paper tiger 
that's on the verge of imminent collapse. Mm -hmm. And you have, you know, people like Gordon Chang and, 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 and Jim Channels and all those people always betting short on China. But I think actually the reality is somewhere in between. Mm -hmm. And that's where most Chinese I know sit. Because people are really proud of Chinese uh, uh, achievement, but also <coughs> very worried. But unfortunately, I think Ch America now is also worried. So, you know, looking at China from outside, most Americans tend to see strength. And they see this unstoppable march. In fact, there's a, like a recent Pew survey that says more than 50% of Americans sees China, not America, as the number one superpower. That's amazing. I think when Chinese hear about this, they're completely taken aback. Um, there's actually a joke in Beijing that goes something like, oh, this is a Western conspiracy. They're trying to kill us by overpraise. Because <laughs> you get praise to the skies and you lose your head and you act stupidly and you fall. <laughs> but in fact, most Chinese just think maybe that's because Americans just don't like us and they're trying to push us back and contain us. But I think the danger is there is this gap of perceptions are kind of mutually reinforcing. Right. Um, so, um, you know, uh, in fact, that's where some of these New Yorker, I think, balance and more subtle journalism of China oh. do a lot of good, like what Peter and Evan Peter, and, and Norby do. Peter, you came to China in a highly, well, not the usual way. You, know, you weren't um, sent by a bureau. You, 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 you came there as a Peace Corps volunteer. And you were very much uh, interested in writing at Princeton. Like, like we, we share something in that we're both students of John McPhee. And um, I think you were interested in writing from the get-go. Um, but you didn't land in Beijing, you didn't land in Shanghai, you started from a very different place. I, I'd love to know what restrictions, if any, you felt when you got there. In other words, it obviously clearly couldn't have felt as, as in Orville's way, and you spoke good Chinese. What, did it seem impenetrable to you, or, or had times so changed that you could really dig in in a human way that was very difficult 15, 20 years mm. before? <clears throat> I, I, because I arrived in the Peace Corps, I, mean, I, I didn't see myself as a writer, actually. I mean, I, I did have an interest in writing, but in college I had majored in fiction, and actually when I showed up in the Peace Corps, I was still thinking more of becoming a fiction writer. I remember my first semester there, I was writing a short story. It wasn't even about China at all. Um, but I was trying to engage with the place. It felt, it didn't feel impenetrable. It just felt difficult. The main difficulty was language. I showed up with no Chinese, and so that was the none, You had none? No, none of us did. None of us in the Peace Corps had any. Um, and quite a few of us became... I hear it's an easy into, language. <laughs> <laughs> it's easy if you're in a, you know, a town of a couple hundred thousand and there's only one other foreigner, you know, I mean... And that was really all you had to do. And there was no internet, you know, we didn't, didn't have cell phones, you know, we couldn't travel. So, you so, that, so in other words, that time that you weren't spent teaching or working for the Peace Corps, you were studying language. I studied possible. like crazy because I, you know, life was miserable otherwise, you know. I mean, it was really hard. You go, you know, people would laugh at you and they, you were a freak. If you walked around, you know, there'd be a crowd of 20 watching you, which is entertaining for a little while, but, you know, it becomes really wearing. Um, and so it was really hard, especially the first six months. Um, but I think the other, you know, so I wasn't thinking of myself as a writer, I was a teacher. And I mean, one of the first things I actually saw was the way that the U.S. looked to my students. You know, my students were all from, from rural Sichuan. They were from pretty poor backgrounds, but they were good students. It was pretty hard to get into college in those days. Um, and we had these textbooks. There was a textbook that we were supposed to teach from that was like, a, you know, the culture of America. And it just, it was, just, it was the most ridiculous thing. Because they'd have like a section on college life in America, and they'd just have all these things like, you know, there were 15 students raped at the University of South Carolina. And then, <laughs> and, and then and, you know, there were students were robbed at the University of Southern California. It was just all over the place and just random facts, you know. And, 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 you know, then they had a big section on homosexuality and how capitalism causes homosexuality, which, you know, they didn't get to the point that's like, well, gay people actually have a lot of money, because then maybe my students would have started to think about that. Um, but, the, <laughs> but anyway, it was just like, it was really hard to teach from this stuff, you know. And then meanwhile, people in town would be like, you know, you'd have a, you know, a, a farmer would say, I heard that in America they use airplanes to farm, you know, because they, they to put the spread, the, you know, to like sow the Like in North Northwest, they do. They do, they do. <laughs> I mean, it, somewhat, you know, so yeah. it's like, the, a lot of these were actually true things. I remember I had a student, you know, my students were from really, you know, rural, very remote areas, and one kid, you know, they all had crazy English names like Daisy or, you know, a boy named Daisy at 
another kid named North, who was like, it turned out to be the, you know, sort of prototype for Kanye West's kid. Um, it was like 20 years early. But some kid, like, he used to ask me a question. He's like, I heard that the Washington Bullets had to change their name because of all the gun violence in America. And it's like, that's a true fact, right? But why do you know that? Like, why is that? You know, it's like, you know, your name, your name is, is Daisy, right? And, and, but you know this thing about the Washington Bullets, which a lot of people probably don't even know in this room. You know? But um, So it's... It, it was frustrating, you know, and because it was kind of personal, because you're the representative of this place. And I was with the Peace Corps, of course, um, but also just as being the only foreigner. So when it did come time to writing about China, I felt very conscious of not doing the same thing in the opposite direction. Like, I, I just felt like people need some context, you know. That's what my students needed was, you know, not the most extreme stories. That's what that book had done. It took, you know, headlines, basically. So what's bad writing about China? What, what are you fighting against? I think you're trying to, to say that there's... How a, much there's, time do we have? I, I, <laughs> no, I mean... We have plenty of time. It's raining and cold outside. Yeah. No, I, I mean, I think that, you know, I just think it's the extremes. It's the same thing as the bad writing about America. You know, it's just like, you know, my students would, you know, either America's a place of constant crime or a place where everybody's rich, and it's like, well, this is not it. You know, you should know something in the middle. Um, and, I, you know, I just think... Uh, and is that influenced by starting to write not from Beijing or Shanghai, but by Fuling, or it's just a, I think it's a kind influenced of intellectual by the tradition. Search? I think it's, a, it's the way you write about your local community. I mean, I think actually foreign coverage, it follows the same patterns as local coverage, basically. You know, and if you're living in New York and you're writing, like, you can't just write about average life in New York City, like for the New York Times. I mean, you can do some, but that's not really what you're supposed to do. Because you know, like, the people who read your paper who live here, they know what that's like to some degree. So you, you do have to find the extremes and the things that are messed up that have to be fixed. Um, it's an appropriate point of coverage. Um, but I think the problem is that tradition is very deeply entrenched um, in American journalism. And then foreign correspondents arrive in another country and they do the same kind of thing. So they find the most extreme cases in China of things that need to be fixed or that are, you know, egregious. And, um, but, you know, if there's no context, I think it just kind of confuses Americans. And it actually doesn't end up fixing the problem anyway. So it's, I think the foreign reporter has to serve a very different function than domestic reporter. Um, and, you know, this is, I think not everybody would agree with me, you know. And, and I, I mean, I, so I was criticized. So, so when you're amount. reading stuff that comes out of bureaus by intelligent people who speak Chinese for the most part. What are your frustrations with, with, with that? Um, you know, I guess that often it seems overly political, um, when it, whereas I, I think often the social, you know, maybe looking more at a social frame reference helps, um, trying to give some sense of how, how, how people interact um, sometimes the, it's rather than just picking one issue in one point in time, mm -hmm. you need to show the trajectory of things, mm -hmm. um, which is really important. I mean, we, we should be honest. This is a conversation that Peter and I have had for years, and because I tend to come at things maybe more politically, you come at things more socially, and it's a conversation we have. And the tradition of The New Yorker is that the writer wins. Mm -hmm. um, I'm still alive, but the writer, the, the writer does win, and the idea is that, the, that you're there and I'm not, and that, the, that every writer, it, it's meant to be a writer's magazine that deeply influences what we, what we do, although there are times when, you know, in a highly politicized moment, as when, you know, during Arab Spring, uh, you know, during the Egyptian counter-revolution, you wrote, wrote politically, but it's not your, your go-to thing, I think it's fair to say that you would be, usually be more comfortable writing about the social. Um, now, Evan, who comes from a newspaper background, might see this 15 degrees differently. I mean, writers are different. They, they, they come at things differently. How, how, give me a sense, when you land in China, um, again, when, what the restrictions are, what your approach is, um, and the rest. Well, I was thinking, um, you know, as Pete was describing the experience of of going to Fuling and how different that is than being the local Fuling newspaper. I, actually, I sort of had that experience in the United States before because I was a correspondent for the Chicago Tribune who was based in New York. I was sent to New York as a New York correspondent. And so for a couple of years, I wrote stories about, you know, they are a proud people and uh, they are, um, uh, they have taken me in as one of their own and I, um, the food is exquisite. Uh, um, 
and, and that actually was a useful function because in some ways, you know, that was what you're trying to do as a correspondent in a place. And I found that, but there is that danger of essentializing people to sort of one element. And that's true, you know, whether you're writing about New York or you're writing about China. I should say, you know, I was informed by the time I set foot in China, I had sort of been shaped as a writer by by Orville, you know, by Pete. I had, in fact, I'd, I'd read Jia Jianying's book, China Pop. I mean, all this stuff was in the ether. And so by the time I got there, the, there was a literature of China that just simply didn't exist. You know, they were, they, there was a process that they had to create a literature. And I was this, a beneficiary of that. So by the time I got there, I mean, the idea of the deprivation, for instance, that Orville was dealing with, uh, just on, on a lifestyle basis, it was a little different in, you know, 2005. I think I remember once the restaurant ran out of pate, but it was brief, but it was very unpleasant, very unpleasant. Um, and in fact, the idea that China wasn't changing, that it was like sclerotic, was, it was everything had flipped on its head. In fact, the default position was that China was constantly changing and moving in this inexorable direction towards, we didn't know what, but we had the, we had this I outline in our minds that it was probably going to be similar-ish to something that we would recognize in the West. And, you know, we would you know, we always couch that and say, well, China's going to be China. Was that a mistake? It was a mistake. And, it, you know, when I think back to that period, one of the things that I think we, uh, and certainly uh, that I came to assume about China was that it would, it would move down this path where every year it would get a little bit more open and there would be moments where it would step back, and, but it would ultimately keep moving in that direction. And I, I think fundamentally, this is, uh, this is sort of a slightly different conversation, but I think fundamentally that's, that's probably still true. But I think we need to talk more seriously these days and in our writing have to acknowledge about, particularism. That, about what's going on at the moment. Well, that China that, really has stepped Isn't that back. a historical moment in time? In other words, that you, you, the 90s, the, the collapse of communism, collapse of so Soviet Union, the moment in 1989 in China, um, gave the United States the sense that everything was moving politically, socially, in terms of pop culture, the tropism was towards some, um, as it were, Americanism, universal Americanism with Chinese characteristics or Latin American characteristics or, or, or whatever it is. A colossal delusion. Yeah, I mean, and, and Orville wrote, the, you know, has written the text on this subject. That, that, that was a failure of our, in some sense, our expectation of China. But I mean, I think, you know, it, we're very Western, and we look at China through our Western eyes, through, it's really Hegelian eyes, that history is moving in an ineluctable direction towards openness and freedom. And I think what's so interesting about China now is, as Evan suggested, maybe that's at least for the moment called into question. Maybe there's a different direction that they want to move in a different goal. Uh, Chang, you, you left China when you were very young, um, but you've also lived both inside, you're a New Yorker, mm -hmm. but you read Chinese, you read Chinese newspapers, mm -hmm. you've been involved, in fact, you've been a f f researcher and fact checker for both of these guys <laughs> up here, and have then started writing for us. Um, and I would imagine there'll become a time when you might write from China. So how do you, as seeing this now in 2015 and moving forward, um, what do you, where do you think it should be the next step? How do you look at it in a future-oriented uh, way? I think What's the, missing, too? Um, I think the question that you posed earlier, uh, maybe to Jianning, about what it feels like to read um, Western reporting as a native Chinese was an interesting one. For me, I remember um, when, I, um, when I was able to you know, read um, the New York Times, when I read reports on China, it felt like um, seeing an x-ray of China. And what I mean by that is the bones all seem to be in the right place, but um, what I had in my head with the flesh and the veins, all of that seemed, it seemed all very accurate. Like, you know, I, I felt like you know, Western reporters must have done a very conscientious job. This was in the early mid-90s. But um, that sense of intimacy that I felt to the country, um, and in myself, I think, this, the warring allegiances of, I mean, keep in mind, I, I um, spent first and second grade in China and um, was ex 
exceptionally slow as an English learner. Um, so it was very much, um, you know, I still felt very much, well, nobody can truly, I mean, with, you know, a child's sense of stubbornness, nobody can understand China the way I do. Um, and um, and I, I've spent, you know, the past, um, I think, two decades trying to reconcile that very visceral sense of loyalty to this country and that, that, that feeling that um, I get it in a way that no one else does, maybe the way that, you know, um, a child feels about you, Even though mother. you're here. <laughs> no, 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 I think it's a, it's a profound difficulty that any immigrant has, no? Yes, um, even though I'm here. So I find myself in the strange position of oftentimes defending China to, um, you know, Western friends and then defending, um, you know, Western perce perceptions of China to, um, to my Chinese friends and feeling like I'm somehow in everybody's bad books, but that somehow I'm, I'm trying to find... That you're implicated somehow. You feel the same way? Yeah, because that's been the story for <laughs> of your, my of your life. life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, tell and me. Now, getting to be my daughter's story. And but, ha so, anyway, how does that yeah. influence your writing, and, and, and in a way that Evan and Orville and Peter yeah. probably cannot? Yeah, I think that could be a very, you know, um, fruitful actually kind of tensions um, that you wrestle with these these pains. I used to describe my um, trips um, to. Beijing, which is my hometown, after I've been in the States for some years, as that Beijing seemed to become like a skin rash for me. Because uh, every time I return, you know, I feel this horrible itch to scratch it because everything is irritating. And, um, you know, I get into this wild mood swings and I would pick up a fight with, you know, my parents, my friends, and all this. They all seem to don't understand America. Or they, and I was very consciously not slip into any English phrase because then I would be charged. You'd be of giving yourself away. Yeah, yeah, I was sell out. I maybe it was mm -hmm. this, you know, they, they call it jia uh, yang uh, you know, fake <laughs> foreign devils. Um, but uh, but so I had that dual kind of loyalty uh, issue all the time. But I think ultimately that you know, kind of insider outsider um, position and tension also have. Um, certain great advantages for writing because you do have that kind of intimacy with with the home scene and because you're outside you're also gained some distance mm. to have certain mm. objectivity you're removed so I, I used to say I need in order to get over the skin you know rash I need to run away and come back to America and grow some new skin so I can actually look at what I'm writing in China with a more clear eye what is to talk about the subject of being wrong, the anxiety of being wrong, either as a diplomat or as a journalist. Edgar Snow famously, um, during the famine and that killed up to 30 million people, um, said that, quote, I, I, I saw no starving people in, in China. I, I was recently in, uh, on a reporting trip to the Middle East and talking to an American diplomat who had been an ambassador in all the key places during the Arab Spring and said, we really, you know, we knew about disaffection and unemployment, but we didn't see this coming in any way. The CIA, Daniel Patrick Moynihan thought the CIA should have been closed for not being able to see the collapse of the Soviet Union coming. Um, and this diplomat was saying, you know, one of the problems since 9-11 is that we are hunkered down uh, we are restricted in certain ways. That may be unique to the Middle East and South Asia, but also there's the Netflix phenomenon. We stay on our, we, 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 we bring our Western culture with us and we have our comforts. Uh, this would not have been the life of Harrison Salisbury, maybe, or, or, or the Chinese equivalent, um, but there's a, it, it's, some people don't get out. We make, mis as we make mistakes about it. What are we missing now? If you had to guess, when we're, when we're thinking about China, all of you, what are we missing and why? What should be our anxiety about knowledge in China now? Orville, you want to take a crack? Oh boy. Uh, you know, I think we miss so many things that I, 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 the longer I try to parse through China, the more I think that history makes an enormous difference. And the whole Chinese historical experience is, keeps 
sort of acting out in its deportment. And I think we often, when we understand it, it's a rather simple-minded uh, version of history. And actually, I think China, too, doesn't do such a great job at understanding its own history because they're, they're actually quite frightened of history. But it is... Of Chinese history. Yes, they're frightened of their own history because it's pretty devastating. And there are lots of no-fly zones. But be that as it may, it keeps expressing itself. What, what are the no-fly zones besides the obvious 1989? What Oh, I mean, you mentioned the fan, famine where 30 million people died. I mean, the whole Chinese Communist Party history is so fraught with uh, problems and, and brutality and uh, failures that to actually do an honest assessment of it would be devastating. Mm -hmm. But that's all part of what is in the being of Chinese, and I think it's, it's very difficult for an American or a foreigner to have anything more than a very cursory understanding of that. The PP? What are we missing? Yeah. Um, I, I think the reporting is still too based, too focused on Beijing and Shanghai. I think we miss a lot from the interior. Um, it's just, you know, it's just, it's geographically hard for reporters to spend a lot of time there. Um, Why? Well, you know, because they all live in Beijing and Shanghai. They have to. No, I <laughs> understand know? that they live in Beijing and Shanghai, but it's not that hard to get to get around, is it? No, no, it isn't. But it, yeah, it, no, it is. I mean, it makes life harder, you know, if, you, if you're going to these places. I mean, I did a project. Um, that became part of my, my last book, Country Driving. I right, chose a place in, in Zhejiang province and uh, a, a factory town, and I went there over a period of two years. I think I, I later looked at it, it was more than 100 days on the ground there. Um, and, you know, it's hard to find that kind of time, basically. I mean, I could do that because I, I was doing a story for National Geographic. I was doing a piece for you guys on it. Um, and I was working on my book, and so I was like, you know, that kind of justified this amount of time. But mm -hmm. it's, you know, that's that's it's not a, new, a newspaper person can't do that, mm. you know. And so I, I think also, I mean, I guess for me personally, the thing that I like to do is to find a place instead of necessarily an issue or an event or even a person, um, because I think sometimes, you know, I, I think a lot about methodology. My father's a sociologist, and I think about which I think journalism is a little weak on. Um, it's a product-oriented field. It's not process-oriented, to be honest. Mm -hmm. You don't footnote. You don't tell where you, where, how you got mm -hmm. started. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you have to be deliberate sometimes in your research structure and your decisions. And like, if you're covering you know, an event, then of course that's what you're going to do. And sometimes an event can kind of muddy the waters you know, in a place. For example. Oh, in a lot of places, muddy the waters because, you know, in an authoritarian country because then the police are on alert. If something's happened in this place, you can't hang out there for 100 days, right? right. In that town I went to, I mean, I, I never got hassled by the police. I did the same thing in, in Egypt. I've been going to, a, you know, a place in Upper Egypt for mm -hmm. more than two, for two and a half years now. And it's partly I can do that because nothing's been going on. But there are lots of things going on. You notice them, right? But, but journalists are addicts of things going on. Yeah, <laughs> but I think sometimes you just, you just go to a place that may be representative and you know just statistically speaking the odds are that it is unless right. you've chosen something really extreme um, and then see because there are things going on actually there's always stuff going on you know like the factory town I went to I mean I you know I witnessed personally like the tax officials shaking down entrepreneurs I was in the room while they're doing this and mm. watching how they negotiate this bribe you know that's that's an interesting thing. I saw you know workers applying for jobs I saw you know how they use their children to get positions for the whole family I mean there's lots of stuff you could witness in my extensive research at your dinner table in Beijing, it seemed <laughs> that the, the conversation always gets down to the push and pull of, of, of the following. The fact that the Beijing government and the entire power structure has willy-nilly, at a tremendous cost to the environment and much else, lifted 500 million people out of poverty versus all the ugly features of an authoritarian state. This con it seemed to me constant discussion. Are we doing too much of one? Are we not doing enough of the other? Et cetera, et cetera. This, I, I assume this is a dynamic that goes on all the time. Is there such a thing as a happy medium? How do you, how do, you do this? If you, how do you judge your own performance um, in terms of what you're revealing and how you're balancing this, this, the picture of what's happening when it's so vast, mm -hmm. so complicated, so populous, 
um, and possibly some things might even be hidden from you. And, well, I mean, the, the problem, the hardest problem of, of writing about China is figuring out what are the proportions of the portrait, because any portrait um, has a certain composition of light and dark in China, and you can, depending on where you focus, where you focus your attention, you can find a story that is uplifting and is a sign of this extraordinary human project of what has occurred over the course of the last 40 years of, of transforming the country and its human development. Or you can shift your attention uh, 20 degrees and get a completely different story, one that is, that is really a concern about the political character of the place and the effect on individual people. And the, and the struggle, and this is, I would say, you know, this will ring hollow to people who write it a thousand words, if you're, you know, and I've done it at a newspaper, but you know, when you're trying to squeeze it into 10,000 words and your editors are telling you, you know, they've got to trim 100 words, you're like, well, Nat, what's the even point of doing it? You know, it's now <laughs> down to 9,900 and I can't convey the complexity. And I, I, I mean, I mean that sort of, you know, uh, that is, it's a constant struggle because you're trying to tweak the, the tolerances of this, of this piece to get that portrait right. But I'll, t I'll give you one example of, you know, a way in which I think we may miss something these days is that you know, we already sense that we're moving in the American narrative of China and certainly in the, in the political narrative that China is becoming more nationalistic, perhaps. You know, you read about the idea that the... Um, that the government is certainly cultivating that spirit and you know every couple of years with some regularity there'll be a a protest where people will come into the streets and they'll and they'll say either you know down with Japan or or whatever it is and uh, down with the United States or something like that and usually not quite that harsh and the truth is as you discover and this is one of the things that you can do in a magazine piece this is one of the first stories I did at the New Yorker was to go and find those guys some of the people who were the the sort of principal idea the ideologists really of this nationalist moment and hang out with them and um, one of the things you discover is that they're incredibly happy that you called, actually. They really do want to chat. In some ways, that's one of the things that they want most of all. So you go, and I spent a lot of time with these guys over the course of the next few years, and what you discovered was very often the, they could hold two thoughts in their head at the same time, even if we were having trouble doing that about China. So they could, on the one hand, be absolutely enraged about a certain feature of American policy, and yet at the same time have genuine respect for elements of American life, and they could they, these two things could coexist. So one of the guys, Tang Jie, who I wrote about in that piece, you know, six months later when we were back in touch, I said, so what's going on? He said, well, I'm in Germany. And, you know, he had been really tough on the West, but he was now studying in Germany and then was going back to China, starting a company and, and so on. So this, I, so I think, you know, as we anticipate over the course of the next few years that there will be this, this underlying momentum in the American political culture to try to create China as an enemy, when you scratch, you discover, you don't even have to scratch very far beneath the surface, you'll find that the, the individual participants, the Chinese people who are swept up in this, have much more interesting and complicated feelings than you will see when you flip on the, you know, a CNN report. Did you want to? Yeah. Um, I was thinking as um, people were doing a form of self-criticism <laughs> just now about, you know, that somehow America uh, missed out all these things about what, what's happening. And that's really, a lot of Chinese feel that way, that we missed out on um, you know, the, the direction where China is going. And there's a lot of people who are shocked in, in China who by the certain sort of regressive moves of the moment in the political sphere, for example. But I think we, we ought to um, be careful not to fall back uh, mm -hmm. to this kind of old binary of East and West, oh, China mm -hmm. is yin and we're yang, so we're two totally different you know, animals. Let's not, not even touch it. And, and you're talking about rising nationalism in China, but I think that's actually a mirror image mm -hmm. of American totally. rising nationalism. Yeah. So it's, um, it's not that different yeah. when you boil it down to, I mean, but the, you're, you're, question. You're, when yeah. you say rising national, uh, nationalism in America, that's derived from the portrait derived from the Republican debate. The other, I'm not kidding around. <laughs> no, I'm, You're not going to no, say no, the I mean, name. You're not going to no, say it. Part of, okay, let me just say this again. Because I here's, was here's, watching, here's, here's um, where I slightly yeah. disagree, or at least put a little pressure on the point. Hmm. Nationalism is firmly in power in China. Yeah. Um, and unless you think Barack Obama is a hyper-nationalist, which you probably don't. No, he's not. You probably he's don't. The, I think he's... He's the, he's the, the, the person to blame for mm -hmm. not being nationalistic Correct. enough, right. American, for uh, being too weak, for example, mm -hmm. and being too soft on Muslims and, and, right. and all this. Uh, what I'm saying is that um, I think, you know, 
okay, let's bring back, you know, the Republican debate. Mm, I was a little yes. troubled by, for example, someone, Senator uh, Ryan Paul, the other day, Tuesday, was saying something like, oh, spreading democracy is a utopian project. And that is troubling to me because I think, while there is a sobering lesson that America is trying to learn about in the Middle East, um, China is a very different story. And it would be um, overkill to say, I mean, no one, first of all, ever talked about regime change in China. It's just unthinkable. But I think it's very important for the Americans to continue to see China as, you know, having lots of overlapping and similar aspirations, mm. both economically and politically. <clears throat> and it's important to keep on paying attention and supporting those few individuals who are maybe marginalized. I mean, they have been marginalized systematically, and, but they are actually uh, still enjoying the sympathy and the support, sometimes silent, sometimes not to, so silent. But this, is, but this is a constant yeah. argument. In China. This is a constant argument it, it, that in, doesn't just apply to China, certainly it applied to the Soviet Union, and how we, that somehow the dissidents yeah. got too much attention that um, uh, that if you did a, you know, a readout of numbers of stories by New York Times or somebody, they're way too much on Ai Weiwei or, or, or name your Chinese dissident or Sakharov or whoever it was in the back. How do, how do you two feel about this? I Jen, think, I, think um, I mean, I, I definitely see Pete's point earlier about, you know, focusing on <coughs> um, a place and and uh, perhaps social issues um, that are that, that exist a little bit outside of the kind of the, the political hotspot. Um, I think that a lot of times um, there's so much. I mean, there's still you know very there's still the sense that you know China is a bit of an unknown quantity. So fear mongering becomes very easy, and you know when China exists as the other, then anything that happens, any phenomenon that happens, you know, in China becomes, well, that's so Chinese, you know, whether it's like the nationalists or whether, you know, there's a group of, you know, really rich Chinese, well, that, that, that's just so specifically Chinese, mm -hmm. rather than contextualizing it within, um, in, you know, social and economic terms mm -hmm. and seeing that this is just an outgrowth that, um, you know, has cultural elements, but it's not, you know, but, 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 you but know, those, unique. right, those impulses mm -hmm. um, are, um, are, are, are universal. Pete, how, how to feel about this, the, the dissident problem as we're in re reporting? I mean, I guess, you know, I was somebody who didn't write about high profile dissidents, but I did, when I talked about looking at specific places, there are basically three places over the course of my 11 years there that I focused on long periods of time. One was Fuling, where I was in the college. One was San Chao, a small village outside of Beijing. And the other was the factory town that I mentioned. So they're fairly different places, ge you know, geographically and also just in the nature of what they were doing. I did see the same dynamic in each place, which was that a lot of the talented people were, were recruited into the party. Certainly that was the case with my students. A lot of the best students were, became party members. Best students came, went to the party. Many of them, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I had this idea before I went there that the smartest kids are, are going to be dissidents, right? Because I had read all the 89 stuff and so on. And, and, but the best kid, you know, like Mo Money, who was, you know, the class monitor, really sharp kid. And, I mean, he was a party member, right? And then, and then the kids, there are also a group of smart kids who didn't want to do that. And they just kind of went off in a different direction. They mm -hmm. had other outlets. Um, and the people who in all of these communities actually who ended up actively resisting were the ones who kind of ran out of options or connections. Um, and this was a very striking pattern because I saw it in all three places. You know, it, it, you know, one was in 98, 96, 98, another in the village over seven year period, another was in the factory town. And, you know, and so it's not necessarily an uplifting story, but I had to feel like this makes sense to me, like why this place has not been changing because the talent is either recruited and co-opted or it's finding other outlets, and the people that are that are most likely to resist are often the ones who are somewhat desperate. And 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 you know, I mean, I remember a really sad scene when I was reporting the factory town. They were building a dam, and there were people who were who were uh, protesting, the, who were unhappy about the dam, and they were showing me, um, you know, all these documents, and they're kind of making their case in a very clumsy way. And then at some point, they're like, "Wait a minute, you write for foreign a foreign magazine." 
And I was like, yeah, I gave you my card. I showed you. And they're like, oh, no, this is my goal. You know, this is we're you know, we're, we're selling the country out. You know, we can't do this. And and they just totally flipped out. And 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 and, you know, they, I ended up having to tear my pages out of the notebook <laughs> and give it to them because I felt bad. You know, like these people had enough to worry about. And it's like, OK, you know, if you don't want me to write this, I'm not going to write it. You know, but it's sort of like it was sad. It's like, how are they going to possibly deal with this problem? You know, how are they going to get any traction against the party when they can't even communicate with me? A sympathetic journalist. You know, what are they, how are they going to, you know, work this through with the party? And then the only guy of this group who, who sort of became very competent, and he, I impressed. He's like, "Who do you write for? Let me see your license, right. your journalist license." And you know, I was really impressed with this guy. And at the end of the, at the end of the conversation, I asked him, "Well, what do you do here?" And he's like, "Oh, you know, I also sell tiles." So he was selling like he had hedged his bets. He was selling building materials for the new town that they were building because of the dam resettlement. You know, and so you saw this kind of thing a lot. You know the. Orville, I, one of the dynamics in journalism is, in foreign correspondence, is how your stuff is played back into the country where you are. Um, in the 80s, the, the way that, that things got played back into communist countries was through radio liberty and all, all, that, all that kind of thing. And when you started going to China and started publishing in The New Yorker, did, did you have any resonance whatsoever sitting in, in, in China that what you published thousands of miles away somehow got back to China at all? And, and how did that affect your life as a writer? Well, in the 70s, no. But after the Cultural Revolution ended, Mao died, and Deng Xiaoping get, came back into power, everything changed. And I think you have to really look at China as this almost uh, play with different acts when you get a very different persona expressing itself. And it isn't as if China actually changes. It's just a different aspect comes to the fore. Now, the mean? 1980s were an incredible period of openness. I mean, when people were publishing translations of philosophy, they were looking at new kinds of political structures, laws, uh, that would, would enthrone journalists as having legal rights. I mean, it was incredible. And at that point, what one wrote came back with a vengeance. In what form? Well, they had uh, a couple of publications which translated things, <laughs> which some Chinese could read them in, 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 in Chinese language. Actually, what? Hedgar was the bestseller, believe or not. What was? Hedgar, like mm -hmm. Nietzsche Heidegger was and all these uh, high <laughs> phil Western philosophy. Uh, wow. Philosophers translated All of it Chinese, the early funny so stuff like only. tens of thousands, <laughs> yeah. hundreds. That's amazing. That's <laughs> That's amazing. amazing. People like Václav like Havel. And Heidegger was a bestseller. <laughs> wow. It was an incredible period, but now sadly, it ended in 1989, uh, and then it started. China started to become a little more open for a while, and then, well, it's a long, complicated story. But you have to really look at the decade, look at the period, to know what the interaction is with the foreign press, whether there's an interest in it. But there, I, I think it's important to say that what we see now in China is not the whole story. It's a period. There is a deeply evolved tradition in Chinese political philosophy, thinking, activism, that is very democratic. We shouldn't assume just because the party now doesn't really want to hear about it that that is erased. It's just expressing a different side and, of And it. how are those currents expressed in, in contemporary life? How, does, how are those currents expressed, revealed, and, and read about, and, and exchanged in contemporary life? Well, I think it depends. What are, what are its life? Again, on the period now, you hear it in private conversations. You won't see it so much in public media, certainly not on television. Those things are quite well controlled. And there is a very utilitarian streak, I think, in Chinese sort of culture and society, people tend to go where they're not going to get in trouble. So the terms of the game are set. And it sort of determines where, as, as I think Pete, you said, most people are going to go. If it's into the tile business, good. If going into politics and running for office is going to get you into trouble, no. I mean, it's true in every country, but I think China has a particular mm -hmm. version of it. Evan, that's your experience? Well, one of the things I think that was specific about this period, uh, which Orville was describing most recently, too, is that, that it was not as if there were these bright lines between who was political and who was not. You know, and there used to be, I think, clearer distinctions. If you made a choice to become political, um, as Jian Yang, Jian Yang's uh, brother did and wrote brilliantly, you wrote brilliantly about it in The New Yorker, one of my favorite pieces ever, was about his experience as a dissident. Mm -hmm. um, 
in the period in which I was living there, beginning in 2005, it was this very interesting time when people were self-politicizing because the technology was changing. All of a sudden, you could go online and you could have a voice. You could say something and you could identify and you could find people who agreed with you or disagreed with you. You could fight bitterly with them. You could choose your tribe. You could um, choose your values and express them. And so that was this, you know, there was a time when I think we used to assume that most people had been so poor so recently that they didn't care about politics. And so that was sort of the, because it was true, actually. For a lot of people, you know, it had been so bitterly hard that the idea of concerning yourselves with abstract notions of, you know, values was a distraction people couldn't afford. There was a guy who I wrote about, um, actually the last uh, blog post that I wrote from China before coming home was about a uh, street sweeper in, uh, on the street where we lived who, um, when I met him, I sort of thought I understood the contours of his life. You know, he's a guy who wears an orange suit and has a straw hat on. His name's Qi Xiangfu. And then I started talking to him, and he said, you know, people here think I have no culture. They think I have no education. And what they don't know is that I am a poet. And in fact, I moderate an online salon about contemporary Chinese poetry. And I went online. I thought, actually, I thought he was completely bonkers. And... Um, <laughs> There he was online. And there he was. He, in fact, he was a celebrity online. He was, he was um, a figure with authority, and he had an identity that was completely detached from what would be visible to you if you just showed up and, and, and looked at him. And in, in that way, this period was this extraordinary time in which people were developing additional lives, uh, and, and that was kind of thrilling to describe. What, what's it like for you to be sitting here in New York trying to follow China and and Chineseness and Chinese life through uh, the various online mechanisms. And I'd like to, if, if you could describe what those mechanisms are, um, where they're limited, where they're exciting, where they're, we'd be, well, this is such a sophisticated group, they already know, but tell me um, <laughs> what online life like and, and what you can find out is like on. on well, I, I constantly suffer from fear of missing out when I'm um, when I'm reading, whether you know through Weibo or we uh, or WeChat, and um, it does, you know, it sort of does feel like it almost feels sometimes like an urban. It feels like a urban metropolis that's building, and you don't quite know what you know neighborhoods are going to flourish. Um, and um, I'm always, I mean, a lot of times it's a subject that, I, you know, that I'm interested in and I'll search for it and see, you know, what the conversation is like and who is talking about it and, um, and what the parameters of that conversation um, are. And what I find that is oftentimes not, you know, it's oftentimes not what I expect. I mean, earlier when you were talking about distance, um, I think for a lot of, whenever I talk to Chinese um, friends about, you know, just the idea of, dis you know, of distance abroad or, um, or, you know, what their significance is, I often sense a defensiveness on their part, this mm -hmm. sense of, well, that's what you Westerners focus on, that's what your reporting is on, and that your narrative is that they are always heroes, that because they're not part of the mainstream, that they somehow um, are, um, they're better than the rest of us. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, when I ask them, you know, what, um, you know, what concerns them, I mean, their idea of what's relevant to their lives is oftentimes so different than, um, than what I see in, 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 in Western media. So online I find, um, you know, not all threads are fruitful, but sometimes when, you know, when they, um, when they talk about, you know, uh, a book that's particularly appealing, it's not always the, the book itself that I think is interesting, but how they, how they see that mm. book and how they see, how, how their vision of China sort of coheres with what they see as the themes in that hmm. book. That, you know. Do, do you follow online life? Uh, yeah, a lot. And, and what, do you, I, what do you derive from it? Uh, um, there's this actually a wild and uh, kind of creative energy if you serve the internet Chinese and there are thousands, you know, they're just like, Seven, 70,000 you know, silos of, of, of you know, bloggers making all kinds of noises in all directions. And when I earlier talked about you know, Beijing feels like a skin um, uh, rash to me because it, 
irritates when I'm there. But the other side is as soon as I leave, I come back and I have this itch to grow back because that as soon as you you know you have a distance and you re and you realize there are all these you know possibilities mm. and people walking around with multiple masks. Uh, they have multiple lives, like what Evan was just saying. You like know, and complex human beings. Mm. Yeah. What yeah. are you not hearing so, though? What 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 is what is the being shut out of the internet at this point? Uh, of in course, Chinese? there is a, uh, a ongoing and uh, intensifying recently censorship of the direct political commentary. It's still going on because a lot of people post uh, with uh, pseudo names, mm -hmm. and then they a lot of them moved out of the public space, which is this Chinese form of tw Twitter, uh, Weibo, to WeChat, which mm -hmm. is more uh, you know, private and uh, harder to track. Reliably private. Uh, well, not reliably, because <laughs> yeah. if the group grows beyond, say, too big, reliably. then it becomes a more of a target. And there are these thousands of professional deleters sitting in these major portals, <laughs> and that's their job, to delete, delete. Um, but I, I, I think the dissidents <laughs> are not just out in the open. There is a potential dissidence in a lot of these Chinese who, you know, uh, mask themselves as, you know, uh, you know, mm -hmm. good citizens because they know that's too dangerous. And, and I see. Yeah, and let's face it, I mean, everybody is a self-interest. Uh, but, you know, people want to, you know, uh, uh, show at some point when it's not too risky that they also have a heart. They mm -hmm. care about certain issues mm -hmm. too. But they do get defensive, like uh, like um, uh, Jia Yang is saying, when they you know get accused of being a coward. But then you, if you read the Chinese narrative, there's also a lot of talk about this kind of, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, cynical kind of uh, little person who can you know hide so much in it, uh, <coughs> inside that it becomes a fake person. Mm -hmm. So there, there's a lot of double talk going on. There's a lot of, you know, kind of um, uh, uh, guilty uh, conscience going on. And But, you know, I think we should always also remember what Orvi said earlier when he went there in the last period of the culture. Of, uh, he had no clue mm -hmm. that something might happen, that, which did happen mm -hmm. majorly just a few years later. So there is that unpredictability um, uh, about a place so vast and so complex, and, and the space is constantly fluid. I mean, it's, it's evolving. So we shouldn't have any, I, I think, you know, uh, con conclusion at this point. It's just another chapter. This is the moment in evenings such as this is always a slightly uncomfortable hinge when you have to have a question, but it's always hard to have the first question. But we do want to have questions from you, and feel free to fire away. Are there microphones somewhere? I wasn't. Oh, good. There's there's a there's a happy volunteer right there. Excellent. You, you're not you, Steve. No, you're not you. Not you. Right up up there, in the nest. You're next. I promise. Okay, excellent. Stand. Well, Stand and deliver. Hi, th thank you guys for, uh, for, for the great presentation. I can't so, hear you, sir. Uh, thank you for the great presentation. Can you hear me now? I can. Okay. Um, so my question I just is wanted to hear the compliment twice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my, my, my question is, um, so for, uh, for those that aren't native Chinese, um, you know, wh why did you leave, leave China? And for those who, who were... Um, born, born in China, um, why, why haven't you gone back to, to live in China? Um, is China compelling enough for, for you to go back to, to live at this stage? It's a personal question, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I did not have a choice of leaving China. I was following my parents. Um, in terms of why uh, I haven't, I, I, I very much do want to go back to China but um, I am still figuring out, you know, uh, a way to do that that can make sense in all arenas of my life at this point. Huh? I thought that, was that a question for me too? I think a little bit. <laughs> Why do I? But you haven't left, and maybe oh. you should explain it. You should <laughs> well, explain I, I, how you do this. Um, yeah. I actually, well, I was born and raised in Beijing and came as a student and then returned to live in China. And that was still, you know, and I was actually there uh, during Tiananmen. And afterwards, I moved back again. And ever since, I've been going back and forth. So uh, 
currently, I actually divide my year half and half between mm -hmm. um, China and U.S. So I'm, you know, making a, a home here and there. Excellent. Th this gentleman here, who, yeah, you. <laughs> hang on, wait for the microphone, although it doesn't seem you need it. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Thank you. Um, Welcome. I'm kind of uh, curious about this uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership, which uh, President Obama says, or he seems to imply, that he wants to contain China economically. It, you know, why not uh, engage China or uh, encourage China to join the TPP? And if so, would China be receptive to joining that so we could have some universal rules of international trade and finance, everybody playing by the same rules. Okay. Evan, why don't you take a crack? I, mean, I think, actually, it's interesting in your question when you said that Obama says that this is to contain China. Actually, I think Obama's pretty emphatic about not using that kind of language. He tries to avoid, but that's certainly, I think, there is an impression among some in the U.S.-China relationship that that's the intent of the TPP. Actually, if you look at it a slightly different way, um, yeah, look, let's talk Frankly, the TPP was designed to enhance the American relationship with other countries in Asia. China was not one of the first countries involved. Um, it's possible China may in fact be a member in the future. In the beginning, Chinese trade and foreign policy officials were really opposed to the idea. They, they interpreted this as a hostile act. And actually today, if you talk to people in Beijing, people come to Washington, they say, you know, we recognize in the long run actually this isn't all that bad. One of the reasons why it's not all that bad is that if the United States had not signed a trade deal with Asia, then the so-called pivot to Asia would have really just been a military exercise, would have been all about security. And so what this does is says, look, let's remind ourselves, this is a big part of, uh, this is a much broader relationship than just security, and we need to be there for all kinds of reasons. So I, I wouldn't count out the idea that in the future we may find ourselves, um, China may be in the TPP. I'm going to make you run right, right over there, if you don't mind. This woman in about the six. Well, okay, you can go first, then then this woman here. Go ahead. Um, yeah, uh, my question is that uh, it's uh, about writing. Um, it's well, about writing. Mm -hmm. um, like when I, uh, I'm like uh, Jiang, I left China when I was young, and then uh, right now I'm trying to write about China. But it turned out there are a lot of cultural subtleties, a lot of things. When I'm trying to explain, but it turned out to be very difficult. So how do you guys, and more important thing is, sometimes I get a f feeling that uh, Western Americans might not even care. Um, so how do you bring the, make the strangeness relatable to, the, uh, to American readers? How do you make West the strangeness relatable to an American audience? Is that, yes. what, is that the question? Yes. You could say that about the GOP debate, I should add, too. <laughs> <laughs> Peter, you want to take a crack at that one? I don't know. I mean, I guess, you know, I don't know exactly how to answer. I mean, I, I think that knowing your subject, obviously, is, is important, because when it's no longer strange to you, then it's a lot easier to convey it in right. a way that, that isn't so, you know, outlandish or unfamiliar. Um, but I, I think that basically writing about China is fundamentally the same as writing about, you know, America or anything. I mean, you know, and I've, most of us here have written about lots of other subjects. I, you know, after China, I was in Colorado, and I wrote about small towns in Colorado, and now I'm in Cairo, and I, I, uh, you know, I'm writing about things in Egypt, and these are all really different places, but it's fundamentally the same act, basically, and, and, and it requires the same kind of legwork and, and the same writing tools. So I think in that sense, there's really nothing special about China. Um, I think it's, you know, maybe it's a little harder to penetrate because of knowing language and so on, but it's, you know, the same tools that you use to approach any other place are, are you know, necessary there. Anybody else? Ne the next question was down here. I'm clearly very bad at this. Thank you. Great. My name is Zhao Ying. I write for Hong Kong Media called Initium. Uh, and, um, we discussed how New Yorker covered China tonight, but I want to mention how New Yorker changed China. One of the many changes, uh, I think, is the wave of nonfiction writing in China. It, New Yorker really inspired a lot of Chinese readers to write nonfiction. And I wonder for the panelists tonight, I don't know how much you read uh, about how uh, Chinese writers cover China 
in our fiction style. Um, and what do you think I'm missing in those pieces? And what makes a good writer in nonfiction writing? It's not a question that you can answer in a minute also, but I wonder how you would boil down in or one or two points. Take a crack at that. I mean, I think it's true that there, there are a lot of uh, magazines and uh, periodicals that have sprung up that I think have been very much inspired by The New Yorker. I, I can think of two that I know, uh, that, that sort of narrative form where you are given enough time to sort of make your case. I mean, when I first started for the magazine, as Josette mentioned, I mean, it was quite astounding. It was five consecutive issues. And you really had a chance to, to kind of uh, feel that you, it wasn't like Evan described those 999 words. I think the challenge in China in writing this way is that, you know, it's that challenge they're confronting in trying to be more innovative in every other field is the controls and what you feel you can write and what can be published easily. And I think there is a, some, uh, although China is an immensely creative place in many ways for writing, there, because you want to be in public. Otherwise, you're just writing for, you know, this tradition of drawer literature, you know, in China, but nobody reads it. And I think that, that can be very inhibiting right now for the kind of writing the New Yorker does, where, as David says, you really have to let the, the, the writer write. The editor can help him say what he I, wants. I, th I think there is also a sort of, there's a technical, there's an admiration for the technical experience of writing this kind of work. I remember uh, I got a, a Chinese writer friend of mine said, do you want to come talk about the fact-checking process? Um, and uh, I made Jia Yang a celebrity in China, by the way, by talking about her in this thing. But anyway, so I go to the, and I figured, sure, I figured, you know, I'd get six ink-stained colleagues of some kind, Chinese counterparts in a room, and I show up, this has nothing to do with me, it was about the New Yorker, I show up and it was, it was, uh, standing room only. There were kids sitting on the in the aisles. All of them working journalists, young journalists of one kind. And I was, I was genuinely moved by their interest in fact checking because it's more than a technical process. It is, and it's a, it's a, it really, it's an ethic. It's about a belief that there are facts and that you can ascertain them and that they matter and that you should fight hard to document them. And and this idea was like for a lot of the reporters who were working in Chinese media, it was an exotic. Um, experience to the point that there was a, a, a Chinese editor he didn't who I mean that in a personal way. <laughs> yeah. Well, I wrote about a Chinese editor who, uh, when he was fact checked, when Jia Yang called him, he then wrote a piece in a Chinese newspaper called "I Was Fact Checked by the New Yorker." <laughs> I've never read that. I'd love. To. Yeah. Uh, we have some. We have some um, questions from our brothers and sisters on the internet. And this is from man, this is from Jonathan Papish in New York, and it says, "Evan Osnos, how is it possible to be as good looking as you are?" No, that's not, that's not the question. I, it's my wife. She's that's, online. I that's Angelica. <laughs> that's Angelica Tang's question. No, no. Is it necessary today for a good China correspondent to have Chinese language ability, and what will they miss if they don't? That seems a pretty straightforward question that I think you can all punt right out of the stadium. You know, I think even if you do have Chinese language, China, Chinese as a language is so sort of profoundly boundless, you still miss an enormous amount because there's classical, there's history, there's... But, uh, can but, I... Can, let, let, you two should pretend that we're not here. <laughs> are, are, is it really <laughs> impossible for people to know who aren't native Chinese speakers to know Chinese sufficiently to get around as well as they think they are? Well, I, I have two points on this. One, um, I've, I mean, I've found having worked with both Evan and, um, and Pete, who um, are very fluent in Chinese, but are you know, not native speakers, that, that I find that almost to be somewhat of an advantage, in a sense, because mm -hmm. they're both so exceptionally scrupulous when it comes to making sure that they have everything mm -hmm. right. And I, sometimes I think, you know, if it were a native Chinese um, journalist, perhaps, you mm -hmm. know, she would think, well, you know, mm -hmm. like, you know, like, I, I, this is, you know, like, I know, I know this terrain, you know, like, I, you know, I just sort of, um, I don't, I, I don't need to check, like, you know, that, like, to the 99th degree, but, um, but I find that, um, and that's part of what I 
learned about you know uh, mm. being a foreign correspondent because they're um, they both are so you know aware of being mm -hmm. a foreign presence in China. I think they go out of their way to make sure that literally every T is crossed and every I is dotted. Well, I I, I don't have the native not native uh, speaker uh, problem, but I do have um, uh, also. A, experience with um, uh, Jiayang when she was uh, checking the, my piece on uh, Wang Meng, which is, uh, who is a, a formal um, uh, culture minister. And when I looked at the pages Jiayang was working on, I saw a field of massacre, because she had this <laughs> method of checking line by line, I've been blocking there. them out <laughs> with red ink. And I only had that experience with Chinese censors because they would actually <laughs> learn also with red ink, and she's I would brutal. be horrified. She's brutal, she's brutal, I've had so, that experience too. Yeah, and yeah. then, um, uh, but uh, even someone like uh, Wang Meng, who's a you know, very high profile writer, and, and you know, was a little bit shocked of getting this, I think, phone call from Jiayang, all the way from New York, just checking mm -hmm. on whether he said this or that, and I think that's, a message for a lot of Chinese journalists that's new because when nonfiction started in China in the 1980s, it wasn't even called nonfiction. It's called Baogao mm Wenxue, -hmm. which means literary reportage. And usually the, the journalists sitting on top of like the Olympic mountain and you know opines on the subject, you write. Mm -hmm. So it's very opinionated, very subjective, and with very little re uh, regard for the facts. So this was a totally different era about you know uh, nonfiction writing. I think today, you know, New Yorker is probably a, a leading you know kind of a magazine that's you know showing an example how important fact checking is in, is important. Though I, I think Orville is right. That's going to be very hard um, I have a, to accomplish. We in China. sadly have only a couple more minutes. I want to. Um, this is the season of lists. Anybody who runs an internet operation knows the best way to get traffic is top 10 lists, you know, top 10 bagels or films or whatever for the year, uh, whatever would have you. I, I, not long ago I read a, um, I, I, I try to read his Chinese history with some, some volume and I, I read Henry Kissinger's book on China and discovered that the most important person in the history of China is, is um, Henry Kissinger <laughs> and I, I <laughs> May or may not be accurate. So what I want, selfishly, is a recommendation from each of you on a book that I may not have read about, about China um, that I can read in translation, preferably, um, that's not by one of the distinguished panelists here. What, and it, it doesn't have to be a Desert Island disc type of thing. But well, please don't start with me, David. <laughs> Peter. I don't know if I can remember the title, but there's a his history book called uh, 1522 or something, A Year of No Significance. You guys probably know. What's, what's, the, what's, what's the year? Do you know, or is it just a year of no significance? Ming Dynasty, I think it was. Anyway, he's just, it's a great history book because he's just picking a kind of a random year in the Ming that's not very important. And as, as, as you see, there's all kinds of things going on, and it's a fascinating glimpse. And it's just, it's a nice way to put his history into perspective and to put what we do into perspective okay. as well. China? I'm also blanking out the name of the book, but it did. It did. It was memorable. I, just not its name. Just not its name. The, the, I think the it was. It's by a British American, um, British Chinese author, Susan Barker. Um, if anyone. Oh. Mm -hmm. Incarnations. I, I did read. I did read it from page one. We've turned this into a quiz show. <laughs> <laughs> and what is the incarnation about? Um, it follows the life of. Um, uh, it follows a, a Beijing taxi driver, except he's had six lives um, uh, before the present one, and it basically takes you through fifteen hundred years, I think, of Chinese history. You know, he was a palace maid who was raped at one point, and he was. Um, uh, a, a young bride who was sold into prostitution. Um, so he, so I, it, you know, it, in fiction form, it was a great way of taking you through kind of the darknesses in Chinese history. Um, I'm going to say this book by a French um, historian, diplomat. I think his name is 
John Palfrey, or, or the, anyway, the title of the book is the Immobile Immobile Empire. Immobile and, Empire. Yeah, it's a big fat tome of a book. It's a, a really about um, this moment in late Qing Dynasty when the British um, uh, send a ship and an ambassador, I think Lord McCartney, mm -hmm. was sent to meet with Emperor Qianlong to present the latest, um, you know. Uh, it's a famous episode. Yeah, yeah um, and then the whole, you know, chapter was, I mean, the whole uh, mission failed, and it was uh, one of the sticking points was that the British uh, refused, and Lord McCartney refused to kneel down. To, to lay prostrate. Uh, to, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, because, and then the Chinese had to explain it to the emperor that British really had a, a, a different knee, <laughs> that there's a bone problem. But anyway, it's, <laughs> it's full of really colorful and revealing stories, both, both about the court and the, because the, the sailors um, on the ship really saw a lot of uh, mm. ordinary lives en route, because it was a slow travel to Beijing from from Canton, so it was a very revealing, I think, um, portrait of China in that you know critical point, which it could have you know it be read as a missed opportunity, but you know uh, it tells a lot about Chinese history. And the follow-up on that is okay. actually called Restless Empire, which mm -hmm. I think well start with the first one. Okay. Can, uh, there's a book uh, that I love called Deep China, which is edited by an anthropologist named Arthur Kleiman. He's a sinologist as well and a psychiatrist. And he edited a book of essays by his Chinese students who have gone on to be anthropologists and amazing scholars of one kind or another. It sort of gets to what Pete was mentioning before about, you know, they have this rigor in their work, but they also come at it with a Chinese, their Chinese sensibility, and so you get these extraordinary essays. The things that they've chosen to write about, for instance, one of the pieces in there is about how China went from a society in which you bought and sold blood donations, people had to be paid to, sell, to donate blood, to a society in which people choose to donate blood. And those kinds of sort of minor things that we would never notice but are profound in their own way. And um, the, uh, anyway, I, Deep China is the name of the book, and I, I really think it's terrific. Orville? A writer I love who recently passed away was Simon Lays, or Pierre Rickmans, who was a Belgian, a diplomat, Amazing. and wrote wonderful, uh, wry, uh, insightful, and often quite dark accounts of China. And he's the person he loved most of all in Chinese literature was a, a writer, uh, Lu Xun, who wrote in the 20s and died in the 30s who I think also is incomparable in the sense that he, he, he deeply loved China, uh, but he was deeply dark, uh, sardonic, wry, and critical. But I think he had it right. He understood the great state of contradiction in which his country uh, existed, and I think it, it continues to exist in a great state of contradiction and needs a Lucian now to uh, go at it in a similar way. Well, I, I really want to thank the panelists. You've been extraordinary. Thank you very, very much, and thank you. <laughs>